on, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another edition of Supercoach Edge and, of course, another edition of Damo's Team Talk coming out of round 10. Thank you, as always, for joining. And uh, this week was uh, an interesting one, an interesting one, because there were a few players that popped off that um, saw a lot of people had traded out, uh, and then some people that had traded in and taken a bit of a flyer on. A bit of a preview, of course, to what's to come. Before we do that, let's just... A reminder, of course, if you are following us on YouTube but you haven't yet subscribed, if you can do so, that would be absolutely fantastic. But also, if you are listening to us via our uh, podcasting platform side of things, have a look on um, Spotify and you'll see here there's a little rating system you can give and we're at 65 ratings at the moment. We're at 4.8 stars, which is out of five, of course, um, which is fantastic apart from the 0.2% that we're missing there. But If you can give us a rating, that'll be absolutely fantastic. Push us up there to 69. If we can hit the 69 rating mark by this time next week, chef's kiss. And likewise, if you are tuning in via Apple iTunes, you can actually give us a written rating, which is absolutely fantastic. Spotify, for some reason, they don't allow us to to do that. But um, through the Apple podcast side of things, uh, you can leave us a written rating and give us a star rating as well. Uh, but with that, ladies and gents, let's jump back across to what we're here for, which is, of course, to recap how we went this week. And uh, first up, we ended up scoring a 2,405, which uh, was slightly above par, which I was pretty happy with, uh, considering circumstances, which I will get into in a moment. But it did see us go up in rank 2,482. We're sitting at uh, and went up. 298 spots. So uh, yeah, absolutely fantastic. And good to see that we are on the way up um, in the right direction, of course. Uh, Looking at our team, uh, so just to give a bit of context here, uh, you may have seen, I guess, you might have guessed even uh, this time last week, we were talking about Jordan Sweet being our R2. Luke Jackson was marooned in the forward line, and we had to deal with last week the issue of Sweet not playing due to illness. Now, of course, as we all know, heading into this round, uh, we all assumed, we thought, that Hinckley would have a bit of a clue and uh, would bring Sweet back into the side, but it wasn't to be. He backed in Vicentini, or the Ovaltini, as we'll call him, and uh, yeah, Hinckley thought Ovaltini was sweeter than Sweet himself, so um, yeah, as it turned out, it meant that I was facing a second consecutive donut um, in as many weeks, which was something that I didn't really want to gobble up again. Uh, last week was tactical in order to do that, to preserve my um, intended trade-in of getting Luke Ryan into my team, which was totally fine, worked out well. But this week, it scuttled our plans because we obviously needed to address this um, donut that we were facing. So we needed to switch Jackson from the forward line into the rucks in order to obviously play Jackson. So there are a couple of um, dilemmas here, a couple of options. The first option was potentially trading out uh, Jordan Sweet, um, foregoing his potential cash rise. You know, I think he could go up around about 70k if he plays one more game. Uh, could trade that the option was to trade him out in return for a Rankin. Um, so that was one option. Thankfully, I didn't do that um, because obviously Rankin uh, did his hammy. The other option was to bring in a Zorko, which would have left me 1k in the kitty. Obviously, would have scuttled my, um, I guess, my uh, trading uh, cadence, because with 1k in the bank, I can't do too much next week. And my plan, overarching, was to bring in Butters this week. So in order to do that, I would have had to have gobbled a donut again. And I was like, no, I'm not doing it. So I wasn't able to go for Butters. So I was kind of weighing it between going for Zorko or trading out Naismith, who was my R3 for another player. It's someone that's a value. And it was someone that was a risk, someone that I had in my team earlier in the season, of course, started in my team. And it was the fishing charter himself, Zach Fisher. So I ended up taking the flyer on him, traded out Naismith for Fisher. Worked out well. Fisher ended up scoring a 116, an absolute pig as expected. Uh, much like a Luke Ryan 2.0 or a Luke Ryan light in this case, because he was just picking it up in defense without McKercher there and uh, ended up working well. And it's actually worked out pretty well considering that Butters, who was my intended target, only ended up scoring, I think it was around about 11 or 12 points more than Fisher in the end. Uh, 11 points. So I really only fell short of the 11 points that I otherwise would have had if I was able to bring Butters in uh, and this whole sweet conundrum um, or dilemma wasn't thrown in my face by, you know, Hinckley being a a nice man that he is. 
Um, so ended up doing that. So Fisher was in my team, ended up trading out Graham to uh, Revel, of course, the other uh, sandwich press, let him cook. And did he cook for a score of 73? Uh, first, sorry, we're jumping back and forth here between lines, but we just want to sort of note that in terms of in order to bring Fisher in and keep this trading cadence going, I needed to have money in the bank, which that allowed me the, the trade of Graham to Revel to bring in 113.3k in the bank uh, to help me bring in Butters this week, this coming week. So uh, Breville ended up scoring a 73. He cooked and uh, it was much like Walter White being like, Someone cooked here. And it was. It was Revel. He was cooking with, not gas, but uh, just with a lot of heat. A lot of heat. But um, let's go through line by line ever so quickly. And Luke Ryan, of course, the... Um, the Seagull, he was our vice captain heading to this week against the Saints. We thought that he was going to score well considering his history against the Saints. I think he was scoring a 160 odd um, previously. Wasn't to be a bit of an interesting game. He actually wasn't scoring too well up until the end, much like the previous week where, um, sorry, two weeks ago, where Ryan was just putting in a bit of a shit one and then ended up putting just points on the board for breathing um, and looking at the footy. Uh, looking at the umpire probably as well, giving him a wink. But um, yeah, ended up scoring 122, so we were pretty happy with that. But in terms of the VC, it was very, very awkward. I normally say if you can score a 125, I'll lock and load that in. Obviously, only three points difference. Really, we're talking semantics here. But with Gorn on the menu up against West Coast, West Coast conceding points to opposition rucks, I thought, let's go for Gorn. As it turned out here with Gorny as my captain, only the 109, but uh, could have been worse. I think across the board in every single league matchup that I had, they, you know, for those teams that didn't go for an early captain like a Bond or a Merritt, they pretty much by and large opted for Gorn over Ryan as their um, as their captain. So didn't lock in the 122 from Ryan, but wasn't to be. Um, well, only missed out on 13 points difference between Gorn and Ryan. So could have been much worse. And that's kind of what I was factoring in that I thought Gorn's um, floor would have been, you know, around about 10 points, give or take, 10, 15 points, give or take um, from Ryan's score. So it was worth the risk. Um, and I'd do it again if I needed to. But uh, most weeks, if I didn't have a juicy prospect on the horizon like a Gorn against a solid matchup, uh, which would have and should have been more solid than what it was, but the way that West Coast tactically played Gorn, uh, to their credit, they actually did a really good job. Otherwise, he probably would have scored quite well, uh, but any other week, I would lock and load 122. I mean, as I said, only three points short of the 125 mark that I normally lock and load it in. So, yet yeah, we'd, um, we um uh, we went that way anyway this week. So, Nicky Dacos next to Ryan in my defense, scored a 105, burst out of the blocks, and um, I think he was turning it over. His disposal efficiency wasn't the best, um, and so on and so forth. A couple of turnovers, so it hurt his score, and I uh, probably should have scored better than the 105 that he did. Uh, this week, but uh, yeah, we're pretty lucky because I was thinking about potentially putting the VC on him early. Um, and yeah, if I was to do that, I would have put the captaincy on Ryan. So yeah, sliding doors, but 105 from Dacos, who everyone owns. Yeah, it is what it is. Nicky Martin, 100 on the dot. Um, just a standard game by him. He was thrown forward at one stage, which wasn't too good to see, but Ended up scoring the 100 after hovering around about that 80 mark uh, late in the game. So, yeah, happy enough with that. Sheasel, uh, speaking of guys that started slow, he started very, very slow. Um, played in the middle a little bit, thrown back into defense. And that's, of course, when he relished and started scoring well. So, he scored a 117. That is a tick. When you get in Miller, speaking of ticks, he scored a 112. And he has scored above the 100 mark, the 110 mark, three weeks in a row now. Um, 115, 113, and 112. So that's all I've asked for, I think, you know, as of this time three weeks ago, uh, when I was potentially talking about using Wanganen Miller as a bit of a luxury upgrade across the buys. Uh, I think he may have been listening. So good to see uh, that he's actually turned his form around. He's averaging over 101 now, which is good to see. And he's actually gone up 46K in total from his starting price and faces Melbourne this coming week and then West Coast as well. Um, so yeah, hopefully he can keep going from strength to strength. And, um, now I think he is actually in the, where is he rank in defense? Yeah. He's the 10th best scoring defender overall now. So uh, a bit better than what he was, uh, as of, you know, three weeks ago. So happy enough with NWM. The one disappointment in my team, I think was this guy, the stall in Tom Stewart. He's dropped another 12.3 K 146.1 K overall. 
scored a 75, just wasn't good enough. Um, I really am thinking now that he's potentially not a top six defender, which is, you know, if you asked me this or told me this at the start of the season, I would have said, you're bloody crazy, and he should be a lock and load for a top six. He's just, you know, in the, what, three, six, nine games that he's played, he's only scored above 100 four times, and in three of those four, he scored 104, 105, and 108, and he's only had one big ceiling score of the 134 in round two against the Crows. Every other score has been... Pretty crappy, uh, especially if we're talking about primos. Um, 99, 77, 62, 84, 75. It's just not good enough, unfortunately. He's at the point now where we almost need to... Like, if you haven't got him in your team, I wouldn't be targeting him. And over the past couple of weeks, people have been reaching out saying, should I go for Stewart? Is he a good value? And yes, he has been good value on the proviso and the expectation that he was going to turn his form around and actually score you know, the type of scores that we're accustomed to Tom Stewart scoring. So, yeah, pretty frustrating. And his defensive rank, believe it or not, I mean, he's obviously missed a week as well um, through that concussion, but it's 33. Um, But even then, I think even if he did play that extra week, he'd probably be around about the 20 rank. And it's way, way below um, par and expectations of, of what we want from Primo. So, Despite the fact that it does, yes, look like my team, or at least my defense, is locked and loaded, I'm actually thinking of potentially trading Stewart um, as a correction trade across the buys. Um, let me just have a quick look as to what buy round he has. Yeah, it's not the best one. It's round 14. So maybe I'll look to trade him to someone who's already had their buy in round 13, which could be potentially a Houston, or in round 12... Um, I don't know who else we would be. Houston, I think, is the, the guy that I haven't got, or potentially Young as well. Um, you know, saving grace is that both of those guys, Young and Houston, Port and Frio, they both have that really favorable buy in round 13. So maybe that's something I'll look at doing with Tom Stewart, and I just, you know, grin and bear it for the time being and just try and upgrade my team uh, as is with our usual um plan with getting rookies off field and, and trying to bring in primos across the rest of the ground um so yeah we'll revisit this in coming weeks but yeah if you haven't got Stewart, i wouldn't be targeting him i think holmes is really doing a number on um his game and he's running carry out of defense and even so i think he's he's marking his prowess like he's, he's one would just isn't there i don't think he actually took was it a mark on the weekend? There was some ridiculous stat that I saw. Um, yeah, he didn't actually take a mark at all, which is just crazy. And I know like conditions didn't suit TIO Stadium, you know, up northern Australia is, is isn't the best if you can if you're a contested mark if you're a key position player, but you know, for a guy that has you know averaged five six marks a game, and you know contested marks as well, which is where he gets his points from. It was really, really disappointing to see. So, yeah, as I said, we'll monitor this um, and, yeah, revisit it at a later stage. But let's move quickly into the midfield, how they performed. Sarong, going from strength to strength as usual, ended up scoring that 118, uh, which was great to see. Bontempelli at 93, bit down on production. Um, looked as though maybe he spent a little bit of time on the bench as well. Like, this was the least time on ground that he had on the weekend uh, compared to any other game this season. So I see this happening a lot now with Bont where he gets trapped on the bench and especially late in games where the dogs actually need him on field. So I don't know what the bloody hell they're doing, but they need to work out with inter- interchange steward. Get your shit together um, if that's the case. Otherwise, you know, reading between the lines, is, is there a niggle that he has? I don't know, but it's a bit of an out of there, you know, ordinary type game for, for Bont, albeit a 93, you know, from a primo uh, where every other score bar one has been, you know, pretty sizable scores, 135, 142 in his previous couple of weeks to around 10, you know, you know, you, you've got to ride the bumps, I think, with uh, with Bont, which, of which uh, there aren't many bumps. So that was that. Merritt, 94, uh, was expecting better against North Melbourne. He ended up getting a bit of a attention from Shields, I think it was, Liam Shields, Slow start again, then came on, um, started scoring well, and then kind of slowed up towards the end of the game, much like Martin. But 94, hopefully he can turn this around against Richmond, who has a favorable matchup against this coming round in round 11. Tookie Miller, 97, another guy 
I thought he would have relished the conditions, but um, just in terms of the contested side of things, tackling, uh, because, you know, Matty Rowell was expecting him to score well. He did. Loved a cuddle. Um, but with Tookie Miller, yeah, he had six cuddles and 32 disposals. So he actually did pretty well, but he must have turned it over a fair bit. And disposal efficiency might have been off. Um, no surprise, considering slippery, you know, I guess sweaty conditions more than anything. Sammy Walsh, 85. Disappointing game from him, but was to be expected. I think a lot of people were expecting James Jordan to go to Walsh. Heading to the game, which is what happened, um, tagged him everywhere and did one of the bigger tagging jobs that you've seen all season. And so busted an 85. And I think considering that, uh, the attention that he got was probably around about on par. Um, but yeah, it's um, not much you can really do about it. I mean, someone of his quality, you're going to get a bit of attention, especially without the likes of a cherry in the team at the moment. So it does hurt him a smidge, depending on matchups. Jack Steele, he was disappointing. 86 started slow as well, but uh, came on and 86, uh, yeah, he's, he scored well enough, but it just worries you again. Like he only had 18 disposals, eight tackles, which really, again, without that, he would be struggling to post a score. So um, he continues to be a little bit of an issue. I know he scored a 112 against North and a 122 against Hawthorne, but again, easy matchups. You can't really read too much into that. Faces Melbourne this coming week and then West Coast and Gold Coast. So I don't know what's going on with Jackie Steele, but yeah, just couldn't get his hands in the ball. I don't know if it's to do with the game plan with Ross Lyon and they're too restrictive and they're not moving the ball well enough and... Too much of the chip-chip around defense. Um, Who knows? But um, Tommy Green, 95, another guy who... He's actually at a very, very juicy price now. He dropped 40.8K on the weekend to now have dropped 134K overall. So if you don't have him in your team, he is a juicy, juicy price point. Faces Geelong and then Hawthorne. So yeah, I mean, obviously dropped uh, in price because he had that five, that injury affected score of five from round eight, where he rolled the ankle and got subbed off in his three round rolling average. Um, scored 116 last week, 95 this week. And I think that's kind of his floor anyway. He's got a high floor, uh, which is good. And you want that from your primo. So you're obviously on him for these, those ceiling scores that he flashed earlier in the season. Um, and I think they will, they will definitely come. Uh, so yeah, for what you're paying for here, uh, and what the potential upside is, I'd be trying to get him in my team. So not too disappointed with Tommy Green. Uh, Hugo Garcia, I played on field in order to loop on Revel's score. Uh, the uh, of course the sandwich press let him cook, as we uh, the tagline as we always say with this man, as we spoke with uh, with Joe from Center Bounce in last week's weekly episode. Yeah, he was really, really good. So clean with the footy, knows how to read um, the play, get into the perfect positions, kicked a nice snag as well, um, long bomb. Yeah, it will stay on the side. So if you don't have him in your team and you're looking for a bit of a downgrade option, even though he's de- he's now gone up in price to the tune of 58.4K, he's going to make some coin and more importantly, will stay in the lion side across the buys, you would think. Um, really, really good. High score of the season is 73 negative uh, 35 heading into this coming round against the Hawks and he should make around about 40 plus K minimum you would think uh, moving on to the bench Jai Clark again started the sub just a perennial sub and Chris Scott pull your head in if you're going to try and develop your youngsters like this is not the way to go about it it just makes no sense to me really but um, it is what it is it's you know frustrating as an owner of him but it really doesn't make any sense uh, in terms of trying to develop guys Um at senior level when they're only getting, you know, a, a quarter's worth of game time. Um, he's better than that, and he's shown that. So, yeah, it's very, very strange. Um, but anyway, scored a 15. It means now he's, even though he went up in price, his break-even now is inflated back to the 56, which for him is probably an equivalent of like a 90. So he went up 13.5K on the weekend. He's at 185.7, gone up 61.8K um, in total. Just keep him on your bench. Uh, hopefully he starts getting full games. I've been saying this like a broken record all season, but yeah, we cross our fingers and hope that he has more of a, um, I guess, a rosy outlook, much like McAuliffe had on the weekend for the TIG. So he came in back into the Tigers side, scored a 62, actually looked really good and got a fair bit of time in the midfield um, with their injuries and stuff. His break-even going into this coming week's negative 34, went up 31.2K. 
And uh, at the price point of 148.5K, he is someone that you should consider. Um, I just think he's going to stay in, the, stay in the team. And yeah, it looked pretty good uh, for, for a kid that's played, you know, three games now. Um, yeah, he's, he's someone that you, th- I think, anyway, should have on the bench and will and should give nice buy cover. And a bit of a cash cow as well. Um, aside from that, Maxi Gorn spoke of him at 109. A little bit disappointing. Um, was expecting around about a 130, but is what it is. A bit of Jordan Sweet. Hopefully he comes back into the team, especially against North. Uh, all we need is really one more game out of him. And this is part of the reason why we stuck by him and didn't trade him to Zorko, which I could have done and would have been an option. But uh, I've stuck by him and kept him in my team because I'm hopeful that he goes and plays one more game at least, because as you can see here via Supercoach Plus, he'll go up 70k if he can play and score around about 85, because his break-even is a negative ding-ding 69. So um, yeah, he's someone that we just want to play at least one more game, and that would push his total price rise to 150k. So we would be very, very happy with that, and happy then to just, I guess, you know, trade him down to a Livingston or use him as a bit of a, a stepping stone to a uh, an English who is still eyeing off or a Marshall even who is someone that might even eclipse English now as it's uh, as it's looking like in recent weeks. Uh, Lukey Jackson, 154, again, relished without having Hodor there. The uh, Shrek Darcy, of course, um, played very, very well. But uh, St. Kilda, of course, they concede the most points to opposition rucks from memory. Let me just have a quick look at that on DFS Australia. And they do a shit ton. Actually, it used to be the Giants. Now it's like St. Kilda's overtaken them. And yeah, it's by a lot. It's by a fair bit. But yeah, Jackson scored well, 154. Um, shouldered the ruck, number one ruck, and incredible. 39 hitouts, 25 disposals, six tackles, three marks. Had four actual free kicks against him. So it could have been higher than that. Uh, in terms of his score of 154, but he was nice to have and good to see as well for those of us that have stuck by him because there have been a few people that have jumped off him in recent weeks um, where he's, yeah, he's dropped down actually from 45%, nearly 46% down to 38%. So in ownership, even if Sean Darcy's back this coming round that he's managed and Luke Jackson shoulders the bulk of the ruck load. Moving to the forward line, Isaac Candy 121, back in form, looked absolutely incredible. Um, probably best on ground behind, uh, of course, Chad Warner, who killed it. Uh, Sammy Flanders, again, 127. This guy, you can just pencil in. as probably one of the more reliable players all season. I don't think he's actually gone below 100. No, he hasn't all season. So he's been one of the more reliable guys. Looked really, really incredible. And uh, yeah, just a an absolute... Um, gun in the forward line. Harley Reid. Now he's interesting and it was a bit of sliding doors as well in terms of uh, if I was to go for Butters, it would have been via Harley Reid. So I can probably thank Ken Hinckley to an extent, even though I'm taking the piss out of him for um, not bringing Sweet back into the team. Uh, If Sweet was playing, I would have kept Jackson obviously in the forward line and I would have traded Reid straight to Butters and brought in Revel via Graham. So I wouldn't, wouldn't have had Fisher. Um, Sweet would have been on field, so who knows what Sweet would have scored. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting sliding doors. But with Harley Reid, I thought he was going to have a bit of a, a stinker up against the Ds. Tough matchup to his credit and to the Eagles' credit. They actually won the game, um, and he looked incredible. 138 he scored, arguably his best game all season. There was a passage of play, uh, for those of you who didn't see it, where... Harley Reid burst out of the center. There's actually two notable ones. First and foremost, he burst out of the center, sharked the, the hit out, ran around, fended off a player, shrugged another player, ran from the center all the way through inside forward 50 and kicked a goal, arguably the goal of the year to date. And then there was another passage to play where he was running through the middle and ended up giving a don't argue to not only Clary Oliver, the pig, the pink sweaty pig, but also Petrarca. Two absolute bulls of um, of the D's engine room, and he's just playing like them, like they're a first year player, and he's like you know a six year player. Incredible, incredible stuff. Confidence, talent, oozes class. Just incredible to see. So I'm very, very lucky that I stuck stuck with uh, Reed out of circumstance. 
138, definitely not complaining. It does mean, uh, unfortunately, for those people that traded him, which his ownership went down, what, 21.6%, that, yeah, they obviously missed out on this score, but his break-even now is at 59 and faces Adelaide. Um, again, a tough matchup, Adelaide Oval, but he uh, he's just incredible. And yeah, who knows, sky's the limit here for this bloke. And if he can go one step further and continue on with consistency. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll wait and see. But he's uh, he's definitely earned another, another week in my team because he was, again, in the firing line as my option to trade uh, to Butters for this coming week. Zach Fisher spoke of him as my uh, actual trade in 116 fishing charter. He was hauling in some absolute pearlers and, uh, yep, he was, uh, he was immense. Darcy Wilson, 75, uh, looked really, really good. Again, went up in cash. Breakeven now is teetering at a 76, uh, which is rather high compared to his average, which is 71.7. So I'll consider trading him, um, despite the fact that he has been able to score well to his credit. But he has made us overall in total 285.9K and went up 31.2K on the weekend. So he's probably hit the wall or will um, in terms of his cash generation. Sam Darcy, another rookie, scored well, 84, went up 20.7K to a nine, now gone up 244.2K in total. And uh, yeah, he's looked really, really good. Uh, but faces a very, very tough matchup this weekend against, or this coming weekend against Sydney. Um, they're very, very restrictive for opposition key forwards. You might have seen, obviously, against Carlton. Uh, Charlie Kerno and Harry Mackay, both of those guys struggle. I think Kerno probably padded his points more by being switched back into defense at various stages to stem, um, I guess, the amount of ball that was going into Sydney's forward 50. Um, but by and large, yeah, they're very, very hard to score against. I was having a look earlier as well, just having a look at DFS Australia. Uh, so Sydney, in terms of, yeah, so they're actually the hardest to score against in terms of key forwards. And just to roll you through a few previous scores from other key forwards. So Mackay 93, oh, sorry, this is fantasy points. I can't see, um, it doesn't filter by super coach, but it gives you a little bit of an idea anyway, a bit of um, correlation there between fantasy and super coach. So Mackay was 93, Kerno 83, Tracy 30, um, Brent Daniel scored a 90, uh, Toby Green a 61, Jesse Hogan, 47. Ginevan, 50. He's not a key forward, but uh, Marbio Choll, 50. Gunston, 22. Ben King, 45. So no player has scored above 100 fantasy points against the Swans. So yeah, it's going to be a hard matchup for him. But uh, having said that, at least his break even is a low 16. So after this week, this is probably going to be the last week that we hold him and uh, will be time to move him on because he's done his job scoring on field for us quite well and made us some bulk cash. Rounding us out on the bench here in the forward line is Riley Garcia, 51, went up 28.9K to have gone up 142.1K in total. Done his job for us well and truly and hope again that you backed us in and jumped on Riley Garcia instead of, uh, what was his name, Rogers, I think, from Gold Coast, who has been dropped, and uh, yeah, if you caught him, you're stuck with him, so at least you've got a nice little cash cow here in Garcia. Um, the one thing with him as well, I was looking at his scoring and stat line, and he's been scoring well enough, 82, 64, 66, 84, and a 51 on the weekend, which was his lowest, but, uh, and again, Supercoach website is not working for me, let me just go back and forward, and here we go. So he actually hasn't scored in four of his five games that he's played, uh, yet he scored quite well. And it's to do with, I imagine, his disposal efficiency, contested work maybe. His tackling has been uh, up there, 6 2 five, three, three. Um, But like in the weekend, for example, he only had 12 disposals. Uh, other weeks he's had, again, uh, 13 disposals. What else is there? Uh, 15, 16 disposals, 64. So, yeah, he's... An interesting player, but looking at that, I'm thinking to myself, well, is Bevo going to see that and be like, well, you're not contributing on the scoreboard. We've brought you into the team to score goals and you're not doing it. I think a good part of his game is that he is a nice little pressure forward. So goals aren't everything, but I do worry a little bit at some stage that he may actually um, become a scapegoat. So I don't know, but the dogs, they're Jekyll and Hyde. One week they're scoring well, next week they're not. 
Um, so yeah, it's it's interesting for him, but you know, he's still got a bit of cash to make as well. His break even is 19. Uh, and according to Supercoach Plus, could make another 35k roundabout, and yeah, then start to sort of hit a wall uh, with some tough matchups to come: Sydney, Collingwood, Brisbane, Frio, uh, then North, but then Port, Carlton, Geelong. So yeah, it's going to be an interesting time for Garcia and the Dogs. Rainy us out, uh, Darcy Jones, the man who we jumped on last week. We made a priority of doing so because he looked really good in his first two games. Unfortunately for him, he has done a hammy, so will be out for at least, you'd think, three to four is what they're saying at the moment. Breakeven now has gone up to 59 after only scoring the injury-affected eight and was subbed, of course, on the weekend. So any price rise that he was going to give us is pretty much um, gone in the bin, uh, unless... We really have to wait until he returns, which by that stage, who knows, it could be, you know, well into the buys. Good thing is that, you know, if he's, you know, he won't return for at least the next two weeks, you'd think. The Giants have their buy in round 12, so at least one of the next two weeks is a buy, um, and he's not missing any other games, but, you know, he mightn't come back until round 14, maybe 15, which is against Port or Sydney, which by then... You need to play another two games because this score of eight is going to be in your scoring cycle for another two weeks because it goes in three-week scoring cycles, price cycles, I should say. Um, so, yeah, he's going to lose a little bit of cash, you would think, unless he has a big breakout game um, or a bit of a ceiling spike game like he did in his first and second games when he scored a 75 and 70 to really turn around that cash generation to really buck the trend with the, the highish break even of 59 that he's going to be facing first up in his return game. So something to consider. Um, I won't be getting rid of him just yet because he might prove to be a nice little, uh, I guess, loophole option. Considering the Giants, like this coming week, for example, they play virtually middle of the round um, against the Cats. So, you know, for example, if you've got a Garcia, you can obviously put Garcia on the bench um, and then use Darcy Jones as a bit of a loop. Um, and if you've got another player on the bench, say a Revel or something, you could whack a, a Revel on field ahead of Garcia if Garcia doesn't score well. Uh, or you could put, you know, Darcy Jones on field and then loop on Garcia's score if he does play well. So, yeah, that's just an example of, of guess, you know, Making making good out of a bad situation with a player that's injured. So um, yeah, I'm not too keen. I mean, if I was to trade into someone like a Richards, who's 124, I think he's priced at. It's only going to give me you know a touch under 60k. So um, sure, it's something, but for me, no, I I wouldn't be doing that. Alrighty, so now is that time of the ep when we go through our trades. So of course, or I've already given it away. Who I'm after. Obviously was keen on Butters. The other guy who I'd only really be keen on is that man, the magician, Zorko the Magnificent, 616.7k. Um, he's got a break even of 78. Faces the Hawks this week, who he could absolutely go bananas against again. He's got back-to-back games. Um, oh, sorry. Th- he's past three games, 160, 117, and a 161. And he's got a good runner coming up against the Hawks, Dogs, St. Kilda. So I could look at him, um, but I think it's kind of the ship sailed now that he's gone into 600k region, and he probably won't even go below 600k from here on out unless he has a bit of a, a crappy game again, um, like he did against the Giants when he scored a 56, but that's when he had a change in role. So I think, anyway, aside from that, Butters is more of a must-have. Um, he went up 17.9k. Uh, and his break even is 95, but he faces North Melbourne. He already had that nice game on the weekend against the Hawks that I would have loved to have had him in for. But yeah, facing North and then facing Carlton as well. Uh, and then the struggling Giants. So yeah, I think in terms of guys that I don't have in my team, you know, primos wise, that I do desperately want, but is definitely one of those because he's ranked third overall for the highest scoring mids and yeah, 12th high scorer overall of, of any any um, position. So he is definitely someone you want in your team. Uh, I could opt for another player as well outside of that. The only other player that I'd be interested in is Matty Rowell. Went down to 31.9K, is now priced at 566.5K. 
So if you've already got a Butters and you're looking for a you know a nice option outside of a, to- a Tom Green who I spoke of, um, Matty Rowell is definitely that. Like he's had a couple of down games when he got tagged in his previous couple of weeks, but bounced back to form nicely against the Cats on the weekend, 128. And that's about around about his floor, really. Um, as we've seen, he's had 137, 155, 129, 135, 126, and 136 when he was up around about the 654 mark. Um, so he's dropped almost 90K from, or around about 90K from where he was priced at four weeks ago. So um, yeah, he's someone that I'd be very, very keen on, but I just see Butters as more of a, more of a must-have, I think. Um, again, down the line, I may even use a correction trade on a steal to get in a rail anyway. So yeah, I just think I probably should go for Butters. He's someone that I've been eyeing off all season. He's got that favorable buy as well um, compared to a rail. So that for me seals the deal with Zach Butters. So we're going to be getting him into our team. In terms of funding this trade, we've obviously got 113.3K in the bank. We need a bit more cash because we also need to weigh up First and foremost, obviously, who we're trading out or trading down to a rookie to fund some more money and then, you know, bring butters in off the back of it. We need to work out as well which guy we're trading to butters. And I did say that, yes, previously it was Reed, but we're going to give him a stay of execution here. And we're going to be weighing it up between a Darcy Wilson and a Sam Darcy. Now, Sam Darcy does have that, as I said, break even of 16. Wilson has a break even of 76. I think Wilson is going to be more reliable in terms of scoring, but I think with that high break even now, it's at the point where Wilson, even though yes, he even if he does eclipse this break even, in terms of his cash generation, he's kind of, I think, going to, you know, he's, he's going to teeter around about this mark. He's not going to make much more cash beyond this. So we've eked out as much cash as we can from Darcy Wilson. I think by all means, if there are other options to trade out, in your case, um, I'd look at it because the scoring output from Wilson has been absolutely incredible from round five, round five onwards. 61, 69, 88, 126, 19, and 75 against varying opponents um, as well, uh, difficulty-wise. So, yeah. But I think for me, he is my ticket to Butters. Um, at Priced at that 416.7K mark as well. It means that I don't have to pour too much money on top of him in order to bring um, Butters into my team compared to a Darcy who is priced, you know, 48K less than Wilson that I'd need to find in order to put on top of Darcy's head to get Butters into my team, which I, I just... It makes it hard in terms of the downgrade options, which now is the kind of, I guess, the talking point. So in terms of guys to get rid of, there's Sam Closey in defense that I've got. I can't trade him into the midfield in any way, shape, or form to get in another cash cow. So I'd need to trade Closey down to a, a rookie in defense. There's um, Phillips. Ethan Phillips from the Hawks is 102K. He's only played the one game, which was on the weekend. Not a fan of bringing in players after one game traditionally. Um, but in this case as well, I think Closey, his break even is still at 31 because he does have a high score in his three round rolling average, which was um, against North uh, the previous week, uh, the 105. So, yeah, this is probably the last week to keep Closey before you punt him. So we're not forced to trade him if we don't have to. Uh, he actually went up 7.4K on the weekend. Um, so I'm going to keep Closey for now. And I might even, considering looking at the fixture for round 11 with the Giants, sorry, the, with the Suns playing before the Cats, I might even use a bit of a loophole depending on if uh, Zach Reed from the Dons is named or not. If he's not named, I'll use him as a bit of a loophole option with Closey. And then if Closey scores well, I'd be more than happy to, to bench Stewart, uh, which is stupid to say, but considering Stewart's recent form line, um, that might give me a little bit of a leg up, a little bit of, bit of a gamble. But if Closey can score well enough, um, that is an option, tactical and strategic wise. Um, so I think Closey is not an option to trade out this week. So we move down the line in the midfield. There's no one. Jack, Jai Clark, I don't want to get rid of. Revel, they just brought in. McAuliffe, he's only just gone up in price once. Uh, Jordan Sweet, I'm not trading him. I could have done the weekend to Azorko. Um, not going to do it. 
Hopefully, pray that he plays at least one more game. In the forward line, I spoke about Darcy Jones. I'm not trading him out. Not going to net me enough cash. And Riley Garcia is really the only guy, I think, at this stage that I could move on. Uh, his break even's 19. Should go up in more um, cash. But, yeah, we have to sort of cut a rookie before their time, I think. And I think it's going to be Riley Garcia. He's almost made us 150K. So he's done the job well and truly. He's scoring on field, has been thereabouts, hasn't been spectacular. And when we compare it to someone like a, you know, a Rebel who scored a 73 in the weekend or a McAuliffe, I think, you know, he's not jumping out in terms of a must-keep rookie uh, and in terms of having spike scores, considering his role in the Dogs team and he's not scoring goals really. So, uh, if he starts scoring goals, he might have the games like he did against Richmond where he scored an 84. But again, that was against Richmond. You need to really look at the opponents that he's facing. Um, and yeah, the opponents that he's facing, as I said earlier, coming up, Sydney, Collingwood, Brisbane, Frio. So tough matchups. And I don't think he'll make, make much more cash after this week. Um, and even so, faces Sydney this weekend, who, again, they're very, very restrictive to... Um, to general forwards, not just key forwards as well. So, yeah, for me, uh, and the Swans are, what, one, two, three. They're actually the fourth most restrictive side to general forwards. So it doesn't bode well for Oli Garcia either. So I think matchup-wise, um, cash-making ability-wise, yes, he may go up a little bit of cash after this week, but uh, if he only scores around about a 50-odd, his break-even will go up to around about 60, 70, um, pushing 80-odd. So for me... Garcia, you've done your job, mate, and I bid you farewell in this case. So he'll be traded out, and as I said, Darcy Wilson, he's done his job as well. He scored spectacularly for us across the journey, but he goes out as well. Uh, If we just have a quick scroll down here in terms of guys that are being traded out according to the most traded out of those guys in my team, it looks like Darcy Wilson, no surprise there, given his break-even, is the most traded out. Uh, followed then by Darcy Jones, Sam Closey, Hugo Garcia, and Jordan Sweet. I think Garcia, Hugo Garcia will come back into the team. In terms of those guys most traded in, top of the list here is the guy that I'm looking to bring in, and it is Joe Richards from the Pies. So he scored a 60 on the weekend, following on from the 107 that he busted out against the Eagles in his first game. Uh, scored a goal in both of his games as well. Looked very, very good, but even more... I guess, pleasingly for him, not so much for the Pies or for Will Hoskin Elliott himself, who ended up getting injured um, and will be out for a little while. So without Elliott and the team, without Hoskin Elliott, there is that role there that he needs to fill as that, you know, sort of uh, small to medium forward. So his job security has gone up even more. So he is definitely someone that I'm keen to bring into my team. If it's not um, Joe Richards, it would be um, Joel uh, Frazier, Frazier. Frasier. But I don't know what to do with those tossed salads and scrambled eggs. Hey, thank you. Frasier has left the building. I don't know if anyone has watched watched the old show Frasier with uh, Kelsey Grammer. Anyway, um, <laughs> that's the reference I was making there. Poorly. Uh, Joel Frasier for the dogs. Do I really want to get in another Western Bulldogs player? Um, can he keep his spot in the team? He scored well enough, 63-64. But yeah, I, I just don't know if he can continue his his run in the uh, the Dogs lineup. Ethan Phillips spoke of him as well. He's only played the one game. Uh, Dan Houston and Dane Zorka, they're obviously not rookies. So Joe Richards is top of our list in terms of, as I've said previous weeks, especially heading to the buys. We need someone that is going to keep their spot. Job security is paramount. Um, cash generation is secondary at the moment. But I think he can tick both boxes uh, in this case. So let's bring him in. We'll just filter this by cash cows. uh, And with that break even of negative 95 as well, very, very juicy. So as you can see here, it affords me uh, the available cash of 256.7K. So if we just go complete that trade and then... Darcy Wilson. So we've got 673.4K, which is more than enough. Uh, We'll have to switch a Garcia or Revel into the forward line. I think we'll go Revel. We might actually potentially play him as we did on the weekend. Looks really, really good. 
And uh, yeah, happy enough with him. So Butters comes into the team. Leaves us with 34.3K. Complete that trade. And with that, that completes my midfield, which is exciting to say. Um, so yeah, I mean, midfield now looking like Sarong, Butters, Bont, Merritt, Tookie Miller, Sam Walsh, Jack Steele, and Tom Green. Chef's kiss. As I said, Rail's really the only guy that I'm keen on outside of those that I don't already own. But uh, we'll revisit sort of luxury trades, obviously, across the buy period. Um, now, that's pretty much it. McAuliffe will now act as my emergency in the midfield. Um, as I said, should continue getting games and should score well enough if need be. Uh, Garcia, Hugo Garcia from the Saints uh, still allows me to have that DP, DPP flexibility between a midfield and the forward line with Revel, uh, Heaney, Flanders, Reed, uh, all those guys having mid-forward eligibility. Um, and then with uh, Richards on the bench for me, Joe Richards up forward, uh, allows me to potentially use as a bit of a loophole option. So obviously Collingwood play second up. So I've got to kind of work out, you know, Collingwood playing second in round 11, I can use the emergency on Richards and Darcy Jones as that obviously non-playing loophole option. Or do I put the, you know, Sam Darcy on the bench who will be highly, I think, you know, owned still. I think there'd be people trading, some people trading him out, but by and large, his ownership should stay around about the same. Um, but I think a lot of people will be playing him on field and potentially not looking at the matchup against Sydney. Now, I'm expecting him fully to have a bit of a down game, a um, bit of a, you know, an adverse to what we're talking about with his game against heading into Richmond, where we predicted that he was going to score well, predicting that he's going to score a bit of a poor one here against the Swans, albeit it's at Marvel Stadium, so it's not on the Swans' home deck. But yeah, I think I'd probably, uh, I'd need to work this out. But, you know, Darcy's obviously had the more, Spike games compared to obviously Richards, he's only played the two games. Um, small forward role. Um, the Swans play Frio at Optus Stadium. So, do Frio actually have a bit of a correlation with Oppo small forwards? They are pretty restrictive to general forwards, um, but they do give points to opposition key forwards. So I don't know, I'll need to work this out, but either way, I think, you know, with the Giants playing in the middle of the round, I'll be able to either loop Darcy or Richards strategically, and I'm happy enough to back in Revel, which I'll need to anyway, because he's playing after Darcy Jones, so I can't loop him. And that's pretty much it. I think if Jordan Sweet plays, that's pretty much it. I think we're, we're going to have to just be resigned to the fact that um, he's going to be on our bench. The initial plan when we brought in Sweet was to play him on field and keep Jackson the forward line, but at this point now, I think we just we'd be happy with Sweet to play a game and yeah, to to obviously make us some cash. But you know, one other option we could potentially do instead of going for you know Joe Richards, we could potentially trade down to a Livingston and switch Jackson to our forward line and then loop Sweet's score on field. Um, but the only thing we'll need to work out if that's the case is we'd need to do it before the round because Colin would play second up. So we'll need to make a decision then and there. We can't use any loophole options. Um, so that's the alternative method as well. That'll give me um, potentially more points on field by playing sweet compared to having to be forced to play a Richards or a Revel. Um, but yeah, that's something to, to consider. I would obviously miss out on the price rise from Joe Richards if I go down that route of going for Livingston to loop on sweet score. Um, but yeah, I think Joe Richards is someone that you want in your team as a bit of buy coverage because as I said, he's going to have nice job security. So, you know, if he does, uh, well, he's projected to go up 65.1K if he scores a 47 if he scores a 60 odd, he's going to probably go up a 70, 70 75k, um, which by that mark, he's going to be around about 200k. Um, so, yeah. Um, and I'd probably, <coughs> excuse me, I'd probably need to do a bit of a sideways trade next week, which isn't ideal because 
you know, I'd be keen on going closey down to probably Ethan Phillips and then one up. Um, otherwise, I'd need to go two down to accommodate bringing Richards in next week as well as going closey to Ethan Phillips. But we'll re- revisit this prior to the round, of course. Um, but that's virtually what I am thinking. Let's quickly go through our captains and VC options. Uh, of course, we will go through these comprehensively as we always do in our weekly episode, which of course, Liam will be returning, making his grand return to our weekly episode, which is good to see. And I am glad to see him back. That's for sure. Uh, after doing it solo for the previous couple of weeks. Um, but yeah, I think in terms of captains, uh, just quickly, I think like there's Dacos against Frio. Um, I think the ones that stick out for me, Essendon against Richmond would be Merritt. So Merritt would definitely be one. Um, Butters against North as well, potentially like Liam Shields may tag him, but Butters is just an absolute freak. So he could go potentially Butters in to Merritt. Or I could go... uh, Maxi Gorn against St. Kilda, of course. Uh, Gorn was you know, I guess quelled uh, by and large by the Eagles. But if you see here on DFS Australia, the defense V position, the Saints concede by far and large the most points to opposition rucks, which as we saw on the weekend with uh, Lukey Jackson, 154, if, you know, with Gorn facing St. Kilda, he's going to score easily 150 odd, you would think, considering the matchup. So, I don't know. It depends if people are a little bit gun shy after he had a little bit of a down game against the Eagles. It would be totally understandable. Um, but I think for me, just you know, without having looked too closely into this, I would be going for Butters in to merit uh, Frio against the Pies. Actually, the Pies give up a fair few points to opposition defenders, don't they? Yeah, there's a positive correlation there. So there's potentially another one there as well um, with. Lukey Ryan, the Seagull, uh, which is in the second game. So that would be an early VC option. So there's a few options there. Um, That's for sure. Bond as well against Sydney. Um, But you'd think that Bond gets tagged again by James Jordan, who did a stellar job on my boy, Sammy Walsh. So yeah, with that, that's pretty much it. Let's have a quick look at our uh, Open League before we sign off for those people that are in it. If you're not yet, Check it out. See if you can join. I think you still can. Um, let's have a quick look. Uh, if you haven't joined yet, the league code is 123391. I don't know if you can still join. So let us know if you're having issues. But uh, we have had a bit of a change at the top. So Dow or Never was number one ranked for two weeks running, I think, from memory. Has now slipped back to ninth overall. And Chev's Titans is up in overall rank at fourth overall. So well done to you, Nathaniel. Um Skits Fitz as well, our big supporter of our uh, everything we do here at Supercoach Edge, gets involved on the live uh, streams, uh, comments. Um, he's in our Discord. He's an absolute gun. Uh, and even had him on for a bit of a chat uh, in our um, you know, fan Q&A the other week. Um, he is in to the rank of 44 overall. Um, so all these boys, all these um, ladies and gents, should say, uh, doing very, very well. But in terms of our league ranking, we're ranked eighth overall. Uh, So that's great to see. Um, But yeah, uh, top of the table, as you can see, as I said, Chev's Titans, Nathaniel, uh, Dow and Ever, Zorocilla, Zorocilla, Skits Fitz, Zorko Zorro is ran at the top five. G-Man, Beat Around the Bush, the Jimmy Jacks, No Deal, McCutcheon, and Missing Link's round out the top 10. So well done to those peeps. So that is it, ladies and gents. Thanks again for tuning in. As always, if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, if you are watching us through there, give us a sub, give us a like. That would be absolutely fantastic. And likewise, if you're listening to us on Spotify and or, and or Apple uh, Podcasts, you can listen to us on both if you want. But uh, if you can give us a rating, podcast rating on that, that would be absolutely fantastic. I think on Spotify, you can only give a rating uh, via mobile, um, such as the clunkiness of their platform. But um, on Apple Pods, you can give us a star rating and also you can give it a little bit of a written review as well. And we will, in turn, give you a bit of a shout out, which we will be doing right here ever so quickly. 
by Senior Cuddles, who left a rating last week saying, ding, ding, if you want one of the best podcasts to listen to about Supercoach 69 times a week, ding, ding, this is the one for you. The two hosts are quite listenable in their approach to teach Supercoach three to four times a week. They have their personal team breakdowns on individual players, a come-together main pod weekly chat of do's and don'ts, and a live podcast on YouTube. Highly recommended. Get on it. You won't regret it. Thank you again. Ding, ding. I should probably put you on the... Um, the uh, the PR side of things, not that we can really um, pay you anything, but uh, we'll pay you in love. Uh, so thank you, uh, Senor Cuddles. If you are keen on having yours read out, uh, the funnier the better, of course, or the wackier the better, um, feel free to do so, and we will do that as well. But with that, ladies and gents, thanks as always for tuning in. We hope that you had a fantastic week, fantastic round at round 10, and uh, we look forward to round 11, and we'll catch you in this week's podcast coming out. We'll uh, tomorrow after uh, this podcast drops. So we'll uh, catch you then and uh, we'll see you next time. Cheers.